<laughs> I know, that's not very nice. Uh, come on, let's stand up. Get this party started, all right? Hey, there was a wife and a husband. They're, they're in the park, and, you know, the wife looks at the husband and says, oh, look at that, isn't that so cute, that young couple sitting on the bench? I mean, they're just kind of snuggling up together on that bench. It's so cute. He's whispering in her ear. I'm sure it's something romantic. He kissed her on that. Look at that. He kissed her on the cheek. She looked at her husband and says, why don't you do that? Her husband looked at her and said, okay, but I don't even know her. <laughs> All right. <laughs> ah, I thought that was pretty good. That was pretty good. So, so here's another one. The guy says, my wife is pregnant, and her doctor asked me if I had ever been present at childbirth before. I replied, yes, but just once. The doctor said, well, what did you think? What was it like for you? I said, well, it was very dark and then suddenly very bright. <laughs> okay, let's, let's pray. Some of you will get that a little bit later, and if you need help with that one, Come see me. My name's Jerry, all right? I'll help you out with that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord God. It is the day that you have made for me, and I will rejoice. We will rejoice. We will be glad in it. Father, I thank you. The worship today, oh, my goodness, lifting up Jesus, lifting up Jesus, recognizing, Lord God, who you are and what you've done for us by the blood. How amazing. Lord, I thank you for healing in this place. I thank you that the healer is in the house. We've already seen that manifest, Lord God. Continue to do the work of healing. Father, I thank you for the Savior. I thank you the Savior's in the house. And anybody that's watching today, anybody in this room today doesn't know Jesus as Lord, Father God, I thank you that that changes before this service is over. Father, I give you thanks for all these things. You have blessed us, and we bless you. We give you thanks for all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Oh, and by the way, uh, yesterday we had this uh, men's thing out at Top Golf. It was a blast. It was really fun. So next time you hear something like that, get in on it. We really had a lot of fun. Let me tell you why I'm announcing it, because I actually hit the ball and didn't embarrass myself. All right, so it was, it was good. We had a lot of fun. Well, Praise God. What's that? <laughs> yeah, you can get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> actually, Art, man, he, he beat everybody in the first game. Then I got worse. And who, yeah, and then he got worse, and I got better, and I beat him the next three games, but that, we, won't, we won't even go into that. But, and I know how to make chili. Oh. <laughs> drop the mic, drop the mic. All right. Ushers, I mean, security, somebody, take care of that guy, please. Man, how, how annoying, how annoying is that guy? Just feel, he's, he's on a camera, so he thinks he can just talk. <laughs> Hey, I want to read a very curious quote for you as we get started today. Uh, it's by a guy by the name of A.W. Tozer. Anybody ever hear that guy? He was a pastor. He was an author, wrote several books. Uh, one of my favorite books is The Pursuit, Pursuit of God. Uh, I, I just love that book. Got a lot out of it. Uh, Knowledge of the Holy. That's another one. The Crucified Life. These are some really good books that he's written. Uh, but, he, but he made this statement. And I want to I read this quote to you. I want you to pay very, very close attention to it. Uh, and it may not make sense right away, but I'm sure it will as time goes, okay? So he said this. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Uh, that may seem a little bit cloudy right now. But I want to read it one more time. Uh, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Uh, you know, it's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Okay, very good. Good reaction so far. That's good. That's good. And, and I don't usually do like a, 
a, a Father's Day message, and we don't, we don't always do a Mother's Day message. We, we don't necessarily do that. But, but today I've got a message title, and I want you to know, it, it, the message title is A Perfect Father. A Perfect Father. Uh, now, I want, I want everybody in this room to take a deep breath, okay? Because when you hear that, it's kind of like, uh, I guess he's probably talking about me. <laughs> or maybe not. Uh, or, or maybe you're, you're here today and, and you, you fear when I get into a title like that, uh, that there's going to be some condemnation you're going to feel or, 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 or just uh, remembering the dad fails. Anybody ever have a dad fail? I mean, man, oh man, I don't want to list all the dad fails that I experienced in, in raising my kids. But I do believe that this message will speak to each and every person in this room. Uh, and, and let me just say, I know this may sound strange, but whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're a child, a, a younger person, whether, whether you've got children, you don't have children, it doesn't matter. This message will be relevant for everyone in this room, and I believe it's going to bless you. Come on, can you put your faith out for that? I, I, believe, it's, I believe it's going to bless you. So let me read that quote one more time, and then I'm going to finish the rest of the quote from A.W. Tozer. So once again, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most, most important thing about us. Let me finish. He said, for this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact, portentous just means extremely serious. The most extremely serious fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. Uh, now get this last sentence. If you're going to write anything down, this last sentence in that first quote, super important. But it says, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. Let me read that last sentence again. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of, of God. Now, I've made this next statement in, in different ways, in different contexts, and I'm adding a little bit to it. Some of you will recognize it, uh, but it's, it's this statement. We create and recreate our God in the image, and, and this is where it changes up a little bit from what I've said in the past, if, if you remember what I've said. We create and recreate God in the image of our deepest thoughts, experiences, our study, and our misconceptions about him. We create, let me just take out that one part because it's really what I've said over the many, many years. We create and recreate God in the image of our experiences. You know, so if your experience is good, God is good. If your experience is bad, why is God doing that to me? And we, we, we do that. We we have these mental, soulish gymnastics around what we think about God and who we think uh, that he is. So let, let me just say it again. We are always moving toward our mental image of God. So who, who is God to you? Who, who is God to you today? Let me, let me give you a, a, a few possibilities. And... and I've probably met somebody that embraces every one of these over the years. So who is God to you? Is, is he an impersonal cosmic force, this energy? Because, you know, people do believe that. They, they don't believe that God is a, is, is a God that, uh, you know, has personality, that, uh, that has substance. They just see him as this cosmic energy, this, uh, this, uh, this force that just is around us. Or, or maybe, maybe God to you is, is that, uh, that caricature of a grandpa. You know, this old man with a big old beard. He doesn't do much. He just kind of sits there. He's got a long robe. And, you know, he's that grandpa kind of a guy. He's, he's 
He's probably got candy in her drawer somewhere. <laughs> you, know, you know, that kind of a guy. Maybe, maybe that's how you see God, or, or maybe you see him as a divine scorekeeper. Uh, think about that one. You know, he's, he's always measuring, always keeping score of your hits and your misses. And they go in a book, and someday you're going to, you're going to have to come to a reckoning on all those misses in, in your life. He's that divine scorekeeper. Maybe, maybe your view of God is he's angry. He's an angry God. He's a mean God. He, you step out of line and uh, see what happens. Now, I was at a place in my life many years ago before I actually fully committed my life to the Lord. And man, if you were here when I talked about how my family that I grew up in, how it just completely fell apart. I literally had adopted the idea that God did all those things to my family because I had walked away from God, the God that I knew as a child, as, as, as a young teenager, I had walked away from God. So all of these were the retribution of God, this angry God toward me. And my whole family paid for it. That was the view of God that I had. And I want to tell you something that's not that unusual. I'll bet you there's some people in this room right now that you've already kind of, uh, you know, you got the chalkboard and you got all those things, these horrible things that have happened maybe in your family or to you personally. And, and you've pretty much assumed it was God that did those things to you, you know, for, for some reason. Or, or maybe your idea of God is he's kind of like this heavenly butler. <laughs> you know, he, he's, the, he, he's the holy Siri. Not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Siri. You know, or the Alexa, you know, you just, you just call out Siri, hey Siri, hey Alexa. Uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of God that's only there when you call on him. When you need him. You want him to do something for you. You only think about God when, when, when you need something. See, remember, we will move, we will move toward our mental image of God, I'll give you an example, scorekeeper. So if you've got an idea that he is your scorekeeper, your spiritual life is reduced to always trying to do better. I, I need to do better. I, I need to be better. Not just do better, I need to be better. I'm not as bad as I used to be, but, uh, but I need to be better than I am. And you're just always living in this, in this uh, quagmire of, of trying to figure things out. And, and I'm not saying being better is a bad idea. Right? We, we should try to do better. But God is not a divine scorekeeper trying to keep score and, 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 and whacking you every time you, you kind of miss it. That's not the kind of God we serve. The point is, a proper view, a proper revelation of God will move your life in a positive direction. An improper view of God, an improper revelation of God will take you in the wrong direction. Remember the quote. Come on, remember the quote, right? Uh, because the quote says, what, uh, what comes in our mind, what we think about, uh, uh, God is the most important thing to us. Because we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. God, God thought about that. God thought about how important it was that you had a good revelation of who he is. He thought about that. And, and let me tell you how he thought about that. See, he wasn't silent about getting an accurate revelation about who he is to us. How did he do that? Jesus came to show us what God was like. I, I want you to think about that. Jesus came to show us what God was like. His intention was to let you see what he was really like by watching Jesus. Amen? In, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the New Living Translation, it says this. The sun, listen to this, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. 
You, you say, you can't know what God is like. Uh, uh, yeah, look at Jesus. We can't possibly know what God would do. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look at Jesus. I, I don't know if he'd really want me healed. What did Jesus do? All he did was heal people. Say, well, I, I, I think God may be the one that gave that person cancer. Do you see Jesus doing that? Do you see Jesus breaking anything that, uh, uh, well, he rolled over the tables, I get that. But do you see him hurting people? He didn't hurt people. He healed people. He set people free. So, so the whole idea of sending Jesus was so that we would have a clear revelation of what God was like, a perfect father. Come on, Amen. A perfect father. You can't ever know what God will do. Look at Jesus. Well, God is a mystery. Mystery solved. Look at Jesus. <laughs> Come on, check out who Jesus is. Amen? Amen? See, when I read the Bible, I see all kinds of things that God is revealed as. He's revealed as sovereign. I mean, you know, he's a sovereign God. Uh, he's revealed as king, he's revealed as creator, he's revealed as lawgiver, judge, omnipotent, all of those things. He is revealed in scripture, God is revealed in scripture in all of those ways. It, it is true. But Jesus reveals one thing about God above everything else. 189 times in the four gospels, we see Jesus revealing God. And, and I just believe that the very magnitude of the mentions carries the significance of what Jesus was trying to get across. Uh, 189 times in four Gospels, Jesus reveals this one thing about God above everything else, and that is, uh, that is, listen, we see God as sovereign, as king, creator, lawgiver, judge, omnipotent, but Jesus reveals God as Father. Father. 189 times. And I just submit to you, the sheer magnitude of that many mentions means something. Amen? It means something. So the disciples come to Jesus one day and, and they say, Lord, listen, we're watching John. We're watching his disciples. John, it's obvious John taught his disciples how to pray. Will you teach us how to pray the way John taught his disciples? And Jesus said, absolutely, absolutely. He said, when you pray, pray therefore, and how many of you know what he said? I want you to pray this way. Our Lord, our creator, our, 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 our sovereign one, our, our omnipotent master. He said, pray our father. Our Father, everything Jesus was doing was trying to get across to us that, that we need to see him as Father. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, they didn't see him as Father. They didn't know him as Father. God said, I want to reveal myself under this new covenant. I want them to know me as Father. When you talk to God, you do so as Father. Jesus, all through Scripture, Jesus, John chapter, John chapter 10, verse 30, he said, I and my Father are one. Hey, you want to know what he'll do? Watch me. Watch me. I and my Father are one. If you ever wondered about him, watch me. I and my Father are one. We, we see in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 36, he, he, he cried out, he, he said, uh, he's revealed as Abba, Father. It's such an intimate term in the Greek language, Abba, Abba. It literally means dad. It, it means dad. It, it, it even becomes more intimate than, than the word father. It's dad. Some have translated it daddy. Daddy God. It's this intimacy that he wanted us to understand. And, and the Bible says in the book of Romans that we have the spirit of adoption whereby now we cry, Abba, Father, Dad. 
I mean, how amazing is that? Uh, Zach put it so well. How amazing this relationship we have with the Father. Amen. It's so amazing. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. We see in John chapter 14, verse 9, if you have seen me, <laughs> guess what? You've seen the Father. You've seen the Father. So here's Jesus. He's, he's 30 years old. And he sees John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. They're at the Jordan River. And he comes, he says, hey, I need to be baptized. And John's like, you got to be kidding me, baptize you. And John said, yeah, or Jesus said, yes, it's got to be this way. This is how it's got to work. So, so he puts him down in the water. You, you know, most of you know the story, right? Puts him down in the water. He comes, Jesus comes up out of the water. What a scene. What an amazing moment. And he comes up out of the water. And all of a sudden, the spirit of God descends upon Jesus uh, an amazing moment. And the voice of the Father comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved servant. This is my beloved worker. This is my beloved son. I mean, what is this? It's all through the scriptures. Father and son, the relationship, how amazing that is. This is my beloved son in whom I'm, what? I'm, I'm pleased. And, I, and I, it's so significant. It's so significant that he, that, he, that, that he said that. He said, this is my son. And it's important for you to know that before he has turned water into wine, before he's healed the sick, before he forgave uh, the woman caught in adultery, before he walked on water, before he calmed the sea, before he dies on the cross, before he heals humanity of their sin condition, before he raises from the dead, I'm saying all this, I am well pleased with my son, and he hasn't begun to walk in his ministry yet. Wouldn't it be great if we embraced the pleasure of the Father that he sees us with? Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that change us? Because I don't, I don't think most of us do. I don't think most of us truly embrace how pleased he is with us. The silence in this moment may reflect how hard it is to embrace. See, I believe from the time we are quite young, from the time we are quite young, I, I believe we are hardwired. We are hardwired with a desire for our dad, for a dad, for a father to see us, to applaud for us to approve of us anybody say amen to that amen. just as human beings as children we so desire to be seen because all of those things to be seen to be approved of to be applauded it, it speaks to us it speaks to us of uh, they love us they love us we want, we need, we crave the blessing, the approval of the Father. What did God do in that moment? He said, this is my beloved son. He spoke a blessing over his son, and that's something every one of us crave. We want to know. We want to hear the blessing of the Father on our lives. We want to know the blessing of a Father on our lives. Yes. Amen? Amen? And when it's not there. It's a very difficult thing. We crave the blessing of the Father. Now, now get these. I've got a couple of statements to make. Please listen very carefully to these. Number one, if Jesus did everything he could to reveal God as Father, I believe it begins to make sense that the enemy would work overtime to destroy the idea of fatherhood. Let that sink in. We live, and this isn't one of the statements, I'll, I'll bring the next one up in a moment, but we live, uh, sociologists, 
psychologists, they are all in agreement that we now live in the most fatherless society, the most fatherless culture in the United States that's ever existed. And, and, and you know when the last, uh, the last or the, the next biggest fatherless culture was? It was during Civil War. It was during Civil War when 300,000 men died, both sides of the war, both, you know, the North and the South, over 300,000 men died. That was the most fatherless culture, the most fatherless society because of death through war. There were fatherless children all through this nation because of that war. Today we're living in what they say is the most, the highest level of fatherlessness ever seen, and it is not because of war. There's a lot of other reasons, but it's not because of war. So listen very carefully. Let me read that first statement again. If Jesus did everything he could to reveal God as Father, then it begins to make sense that the enemy would work overtime to destroy the idea of fatherhood. Number one. Number two, Satan knows that if he can destroy the concept of healthy earthly fatherhood, then he can create a stumbling block for humanity uh, to relate in a healthy way to Father God. That's what's going on here. That's what's behind that. That's why so many people, uh, you know, we, we, we can't relate to a Father God because the enemy has put so many stumbling blocks in our way of how we saw our earthly fathers, then, then we say, hey, uh, our Father who art in heaven. Those are not warm, fuzzy feelings. Yeah. Let, let me describe six different kinds of, of dads or, or, or of fathers. There are a lot more, and I, I don't say these uh, to bring condemnation on anybody. But I guarantee in these six kinds of dads, See, not, not everybody in this room is a dad. I understand that. But I, can, can I wager a, a, bet, a bet with y'all? I know I'm not a betting man, but can I wager a bet? I'm going to win this one. Uh, 100%, I'm going to win this one. Everybody in this room had a dad. <laughs> Am I right? Now, if you didn't have a dad, come see me after, because, boy, we got a great interview we want to do. I didn't say you knew your dad. Maybe you didn't know your dad. But everybody in this room had a dad, even if you were, you know, conceived in a Petri dish. I don't think there's anybody like that here. But you understand, everybody had a dad. Not everybody in this room is a dad, but everybody had a dad. Six kinds of dads. Number one, the absent father. The absent father, maybe uh, not present, maybe because of divorce, maybe death, maybe just they were just totally disinterested in, in the children that he had born. Uh, the abusive father, verbally, emotionally, physically abusive. The performance-based father. He, he wanted to bless you, but you had to earn it. You, you never get a blessing from that dad unless you've earned it. There, there, there's, there's always this performance involved in that kind of fatherhood. A passive dad. He's present but not leading, doesn't speak up, doesn't, doesn't speak into the life of his children. The antagonistic dad. Uh, oftentimes uh, because of the personal fatherlessness that they experienced. But they're antagonistic, always critical, always cutting, always telling you you're not going to measure up. And, and there's a twisted side to that uh, because sometimes we think if we tell somebody they're not going to measure up, they're going to work harder to prove us wrong. And, and you know what? Statistics say that that doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work. And then there's the sixth one, the empowering dad. The empowering dad. Uh, the, the, not a perfect dad. There are no, I don't even know there's no such thing as perfect dad. Right? No, no such thing as perfect dad except the perfect father we're talking about. But the empowering, the empowering dad. He loved and it wasn't ever based on performance. This dad finds a way to make uh, the kids feel uh, their potential. They, they know they're loved. Should they fail, the dad says, hey, let's move past this. They, they correct with authority, uh, yet with kindness. You knew you blew it, but your dad wasn't rejecting you in your failure. Boy, isn't, isn't that the kind of dad we all, all wanted? 
And, and maybe you were that kind of dad. God bless you. That's good. But that's a minority. It truly is. See, the problem, so many in this room, so many in this room are saying, if God is anything like my dad, no thanks. And you're sitting there thinking that right now, and you're feeling bad for thinking that. I, I get it. I, I do. I get that. But if God is anything like my dad, sometimes we say, oh, don't you want to turn your life over? He's a heavenly father. And they hear that word, and it's, it's such a loaded word to them because of what they experienced. And, and, and so many in this room, I'm, I'm talking to you. You know I'm talking to you. The experience was not pleasant. There are not warm and fuzzies when you hear the word father, heavenly father. If God is like my dad, I, I, I want to keep a distance. I never understood my dad. I'll never understand God, especially as father. I'll never understand. So, so what, do we, what do we do with all this? What, what do we do with all this? I, I, was, I was listening to a message by a pastor of a church in Atlanta, Georgia. It, it's, it's called Passion City Church. Passion City Church. What? I, that's such a cool name for a church. Passion City. Uh, can you imagine Van Dyke, people driving by, and it just says Passion City above it? How many would say, that might not be a church? I don't know. Anyway, but, but of course you put the word church under it, and that, that clarifies it. But Passion City Church. Uh, Louis uh, Giglio. He's the pastor there. Uh, what a cool name. Cool name. But Louis Giglio, in a message that I was watching, he said this. He said, God is not a bigger version of your earthly dad. He reveals a perfected version of your earthly dad. Man, I like that. He, he's the dad that all of us probably wish we had. And again, this is not to throw you know, condemnation anywhere. Because nobody in this room was a perfect dad. Every one of us made mistakes. Amen? He, he's the kind of God, he's the kind of dad that, that you dreamed your earthly father would be. And, and he's so much more. He's not just a bigger version. He is a perfect version of your father. Our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Amen? Amen? He's a good, good father. Yes. You may be in this room right now and you say, listen, I can relate. I can relate to a broken relationship with my dad. I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but many of us in this room, you, uh, you have wounds. You have scars. You've been disappointed. You've been abandoned. You've been walked out on. You've been mistreated. And, and I mean, just the idea of Father's Day is just not even a pleasant thought for you. Now, maybe you have to pick up the phone and grudgingly offer a happy Father's Day. I mean, there's so much pain surrounding fatherhood. Isn't it, is it any wonder why there is with the, the tactics and the tricks of the enemy to destroy the idea of fatherhood so you can't relate to your father God in a healthy way? It, it does make sense. So you're sitting here today and you have those kind of wounds. And you say, yeah, I can relate to all that. I, and I'll tell you what, there, there, that's an area of my life I, 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 just, I just feel stuck. I feel stuck. Maybe you go, I didn't feel stuck till I came in here. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever cut yourself? You ever, you ever cut yourself? I mean, even a bad cut? I remember a few years ago, I was putting the umbrella in the in the the stand. Yeah, it was a huge umbrella. It's like a 10-foot umbrella, big umbrella. I go to put it in the stand, and my, one of my grandkids is with me, and I lower down into the stand, and just the way this thing came down, and you know, the, 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 the bottom part of it is, is sharp. It's sharp metal. The way it came down caught my thumb, and I mean, the scar is still there. I mean, it, ooh, it was bad. It was bad. And it was bleeding. 
But you know what I did? You know, people were saying, you need, a, you need to get stitches. And I'm thinking, i just bandage it up. It'll be fine. Right. You know what? So I, I did. I wrapped it up. I just kind of wrapped it up and went about my work, you know, after I ran around the yard for a little while, hold my hand. <laughs> my wife likes it when I hurt myself. She goes, oh, you're so funny. <laughs> she, she gets a kick out of it. Goes, ah, you know. But it, it, was, it was pretty deep. It was pretty bad. And you know what? I, but I, but I, I wrapped it up, put some gauze on it, put a bunch of band-aids on it, went about my day. Uh, you know, how, how many of you know you can, you can cover your wound, but that wound's still there? There are a lot of people in this room, you've covered your wounds. Uh, they haven't been healed yet. I believe that a perfect father wants to heal those wounds. Amen? He does. You know why? Because he's a, he's a good, good father. And I, I believe he says, there is a special place in my heart for you. There's a special place in my heart for you. I am a father to the fatherless. That's who he says he is. Come on, let's stand together. I, I'm going to ask my son, Zach, to come up here uh, because I, I believe he's got a, a declaration he wants to declare over you in just a moment. Uh, I want you to close your eyes, though. I want you to close your eyes. Uh, there, there's a scripture in, in Matthew chapter 7. And, and the context of this is the Holy Spirit and it's talking about knocking and asking and seeking and, and all that. And then it goes into... You know, if you, ask, if you ask the father for a piece of bread, he won't give you a rock. I mean, because he's a good dad, right? Some, some of you need to ask God to reveal himself as father to you. Because that, that, that's, a, that's a tough nut to crack. There's so many wounds, so much pain in this whole thing for you. And, and maybe the pain is not in what you received. Maybe the pain is just reflecting on, on who you've been and who you are and, and you just need God to touch that part of your heart and bring healing for you because he's that kind of God. Maybe, maybe you were the type of person you, you went to your father and you said, Father, give me, I, I need a piece of bread and, and he did give you a rock. He was that kind of dad. Or maybe, maybe you had a dad and you said, hey, I, I, I'd really like a fish. And obviously this comes out of Matthew chapter 7. I asked for a fish and he gave you a scorpion. Maybe, maybe, maybe you need to ask again and you need to keep on asking and knock and keep on knocking. And, and ask God to reveal himself as the kind of God that gives you the bread and gives you the fish. Because he's a good, good father. Amen? He is a good, good father. With heads bowed and eyes closed, listen, I want you to really think about this. Because I want you to think about how, how God sees you right now. God loves you. You may not have experienced love from your father. Maybe, maybe you had all different kinds of things going on. But I want you to know right now, you are loved by this perfect father. You are loved by this perfect Father. Please embrace that. Maybe you don't think that's a big revelation, but I, I'm telling you right now, if, if a light could shine down on everybody that wonders if God loves them, there would be beams of light shooting all over the place in here. You believe what it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. You believe that, you quote it but you've never really embraced it for yourself. Father God, I just pray right now. I pray for these people. I pray, Father God, for every single person in this room, no matter what they experienced in, in growing up, no matter what they experienced, whether it was good or not as good, good or, or quite bad, Father God, I, I just pray that they get a revelation of you as Father. 
And Father God, that that begins to heal the wounds. It begins to uh, uh, reduce and eliminate the scar tissue. Father God, that they stop covering with bandages those areas of their heart that, that have been wounded, Lord. I, I just pray that there be healing. That, Father God, they come into a newness of relationship with you as Abba, Father. I thank you for that, Lord. You're a good, good Father. In Jesus' name. If you're a man, can you raise your hand? Even if you're a young man. All right, I want everyone to find someone with their hands up, if they're a man. If you can tell they're lying, don't lay hands on them. <laughs> all right, I'm just gonna, I have a declaration. I wanna pray over you, and so I want all of you to agree with me. And men, just receive, just receive. God, I ask that your light would come and shine Holy Spirit, that you lead them as men to walk in the light, even as you are in the light. That there be no shadow in them. Lord, that your light would shine on them to reveal every lie they believe about you as a father and who you've created them to be as sons of God. Lord, I ask that the, your light come and shine on unfruitful distraction. And so right now, I just release the light of heaven over each and every one of you. And I declare over you men, I declare that you are men of singular focus, single-mindedness. I declare that you are men firm in your conviction, bold and courageous to walk and stand in who you are created to be. And I declare over you men of powerful faith, that you be men filled with hope, walking and standing in powerful faith. I bless you in Jesus' name, men of honor, and I honor you for who God has created you to be. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on, let's give God thanks for that. Thank you, God. Just remain standing. I want to lead you in a prayer for salvation in just a moment, but I heard this statement. Actually, that pastor said this. He said, you need to understand that heaven, this, this may sound wrong to you, but just stay with me. Heaven is not your payoff for salvation. Wait a minute. Did he just say that? Heaven is not the payoff. The payoff is now you have a perfect father. Amen. How amazing. What an amazing statement. I, I just love that, don't you? Heads bowed, eyes closed, just for another moment. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, come on, let's, let's take care of that right now. I'm going to lead everybody in this room in a prayer. We'll all pray it together, right where you're at. But if you've never made him Lord of your life, or if you've made him Lord, but, you know, you're just not living it, you kind of slid back in your old ways, then let's take care of that right now. Can we do that? Uh, before I pray with you, and we're all going to pray right where you're at, before we do that, I want to know who you are. So heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. I'm going to count to three, and if that's you, you say, I need to make him Lord, or I need to recommit to the Lordship, then I want you to lift your hand when I count to three, all around this room. I'm gonna look from my right, your left, all around the room. I wanna see who you are. Come on, are you ready? Only do it if you mean it. Ready, one, two, three, around this room. Come on, come on, there you go. Thank you, thank you. God bless you, thank you for raising your hand. There's another one back there, thank you so much. Just around this room, anybody else? Anybody else? There, there are a few hands that went up, I appreciate that. Listen, if you're, you can put your hands down. Another couple went up. Thank you. Now, if you raised your hand or you know you should have, I want you to pray this prayer as we all pray it together. Mean it from your heart. Say it out loud with your mouth. Watch what God begins to do in your life. 
He is a good, good Father. Amen? Come on, let's pray together. Dear God, I come to you today just as I am. I give you my life. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. You rose from the dead and you live forever. Be Lord of my life. From this day forward, I will live for you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for being my father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, are you glad for that? <clears throat> How many are glad you came today? Am I glad you came today? Praise God. Come on, welcome my, I mean, is she just the prettiest thing today? She's so pretty. Oh, that's my wife. <laughs>